Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth season of Ready to Scale. I'm your host, Ellie Perlman. Real estate investing is not rocket science, but it's not a fairy tale either. It's an incredible investment vehicle that builds and grows wealth. I have done it, and this is why so many of the wealthiest people in America and in the world, actually, invest in real estate as well. Listen in every week to learn all the different real estate asset classes, which strategies experienced and successful investors use to live their best lives and the processes to do it. Welcome to Ready to Scale Season 4. Let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from Arizona today, still here walking properties. Today I have a very, very special guest and I'm really, really excited to have Erin Sykes on the show. So if you haven't seen her because she's everywhere, um, she's the chief economist for Nest Seekers International and she's an expert um, on the intersection of crypto and real estate. And of course, we're gonna talk about that. It's a very, very interesting and hot topic. She's a frequent guest on Fox Business News, CNBC, CNN, NBC News, Bloomberg, Forbes, and TechCrunch. So you probably saw her at some point in, uh, in, in many more platforms that we just don't have time to cover all of them. Um, and if this is not enough, then Erin also holds an MBA from Pepperdine University and a bachelor's in finance and international business from the um, Villanova University. And interestingly enough, uh, she also splits her time between Florida and New York City. So that's, that's very interesting. You get the best uh, of both worlds. So without further ado, I want to welcome Erin to the show. Hi, Erin. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, I've watched um, some of your interviews online and uh, you know, you, you're always um, very eloquent and very knowledgeable. So I'm really, really uh, excited to have you on the show today. Um, but before we start, and we have a lot of topics to cover, um, I wanted to hear from you a little bit more about, you know, your background, how you got to real estate, um, and how was it like to start, um, you know, many years ago? Sure. So as you mentioned, I studied finance in undergraduate. However, I never really worked in straight up finance Wall Street. I always was kind of with the bigger corporations in, in a marketing capacity. So I was with Estee Lauder for 10 years. Um, and then I actually circled back to the family business. And I worked for my father, who was a contractor in Atlantic City uh, commercial. And he did all the casinos and a lot of um, large scale schools and that type of thing. And I loved, loved the construction industry. I just wasn't really feeling life in Atlantic City anymore. So that's where I grew up, but I wanted to move on and, you know, get back to New York. So um, basically full circle, I started working in real estate on the residential side. I was first licensed in New York and then later in Florida. And um, it kind of combined all of those different aspects that I had from my prior career um, when I was in marketing with Estee Lauder and the luxury angle, as well as the construction. So it was a good training ground for, for now being in residential real estate, as well as chief economist for nest seekers. Awesome. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, I've had several guests that um, were basically, you know, mentioned that one of their parents were in real estate and that kind of you know, ignited the, their, um, uh, their career and their interest in real estate. Um, so, you know, when it comes to, um, and, and you talk a lot about, you know, the economy and what's happening um, right now, and you analyze the, uh, the moves that have been made by the government, um, I want to kind of kick off our conversation. We're talking about a little bit of, on the asset side on um, how, the um, uh, rent hikes done by the the you know the feds. How is that is going to impact real estate and specifically you know single family homes? There are a lot of investors out there that are buying rentals, and um, you know it's we've been waiting for you know the feds to increase you know rents, and it's it's happening. It will happen you know more and more. So we'd love to hear your take on um, on that angle. 
Yeah. So basically since the last announcement, I have personally, and I work primarily in Florida during this time of year, um, I have seen such an acceleration of people who were potentially on the fence about buying something, be it a personal property or an investment property, or had, they had been shopping for the perfect place for a while. And because the market is so tight, uh, in addition to this looming rate hike, they've really, um, put their foot on the gas and everybody wants to be in contract now. And they want to make sure that they're locking in that rate for 30 days and then being able to take advantage of the ultra, ultra low rates that we still have in place now. Granted, likely we're only gonna see a 25% um, of a point increase in the first, first hike. However, you know, things have been so low for so long, it's really inevitable that they're going to level out again. And with everything that's going on in the world right now, there's so much uncertainty and uncertainty is really um, destructive to most investors. And that's where um, they get a bit of cold feet. So we will see exactly how this all shakes the market out, but I have not seen any um, deceleration in the Florida market or in the Hamptons market in terms of people really wanting to get into a property and get in quick. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because even though there's a feeling that um, the market is very hot, it's getting hotter and hotter. And you're right, some people were waiting two years ago for the market to cool off. And it, you know, if you bought two years ago, you're you you were in you made the right decision. You know, looking at it from you know uh, today's perspective, but it it seems like the the market is getting hotter, the interest rates are increasing, and yet you know, investors are still buying homes and people still buy homes to, you know, for their main, you know, residents. And um, it's, it's interesting that this is all happening while there's still inflation. I mean, it's, we, we see that, you know, payroll is, is going up, salaries are going up. And I think it's been, uh, um, it's, it's been a while since that happened. So maybe it's about time. Um, but rents are also going up across the board um, in many, many markets. We see, we're not talking about three to 5%. We're talking about 20, 30, 40% rent increases. Um, so with inflation, you know, with what's happening in the market right now, and we see it on our, um, in, you know, the multifamily assets that we own, same, you know, the minimum, I would say is 10% uh, across Texas, Florida, Georgia, we get sometimes a little bit above 60%, which is pretty significant. Um, what do you think, uh, what factors, so do you think that the inflation is going to continue? And what do you think is going to impact the, you know, this environment? Yeah, so the tricky part about inflation is that you don't know that you're in it until it's too late. Yeah. So if we kind of circle back when everybody's saying this is transitory, this is only going to be a couple months, it's never a couple months. Inflation sticks. It's, it's really um, a pretty simple type of metric. Um, but once you're in it, it's very difficult to get out of it. So the mm -hmm. worst place to have your money during a high inflationary period is in cash because that cash is still sitting at the same exact value. And it's not increasing its value alongside with inflation or anything else. It's, it's just kind of sitting heavy. And um, of course, you do need to be somewhat liquid, as we talked about before, with times of uncertainty, you do want to have some dry powder. But one of the best places to invest during an inflationary period is in real estate, because as you mentioned, those, rent, those rents have accelerated at or well ahead of the rate of inflation. So you're still making a good return on your money. And I think that's why we continue to see more real estate investment despite the looming rate hikes and the inflation. Yeah, if only supply was a little bit better. The supply that that's what everyone is um is dealing with. And that's why we see a lot of um investors overbid because it's better to pay a little bit extra in their minds in some in instances than to, like you said, sit on cash. And that's going to be more expensive than the incremental increase in, in, the, in the cash that they're going to pay for the asset. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about metaverse, which uh, is a fascinating topic. And um, a lot of investors actually uh, admit that 
even though it's fascinating it, to them, they don't know much about it. And, you know, Zillow is, in, is on Metaverse now, and it seems like uh, there's a lot of curiosity um, from investors' point of view. Um, what are your thoughts about what's happening in the Metaverse right now, um, buying, you know, besides NFTs, the buying uh offices and homes and buying and selling and trading on the metaverse real estate supposed to be real a metaverse is is it real so the metaverse in my mind is here to stay this is truly web 3.0 and i know that it's taking a hot second for people to really believe in it and and grasp what's going to happen here and maybe some people are dragging their feet and saying oh it's not you know this is just a blip on the radar this is nothing but i truly believe that this is really um, the next stage of the web and so I think the easiest way for those individuals who are kind of, you know, not on the bandwagon yet, I think the easiest way for them to understand property in the metaverse is to think of it as advertising space rather than a physical piece of land because you're buying exposure and whether that's putting, you know, your storefront, if we put nest seekers international on a storefront into central land, and that way everybody that is traveling via their Oculus and, you know, maybe heading over to Paris Hilton's um, Paris world or um, Snoop world, or, you know, any of the other celebrities that are very quickly going to ramp up, um, they're going to see your storefront. And the same thing, when we do um, remote virtual tours, before it was just you know on FaceTime, we're trying to sell something through a screen that's only a few inches large and you know very one dimensional. So now you can wear the Oculus. And I think it was the most amazing experience when I was recently um, at the 11 residences sales gallery in Miami because they have true meta reality um, pre-construction uh, full on experience, all five senses where you're wearing the Oculus, you are touring this pre-construction uh, tower. You are maybe in the club room and you hear the crackling of the fireplace. And then you have the smell of wood burning. And then mm -hmm. you walk over to the bar area and you're handed in your avatar is handed a cocktail. But in, the, in real life, somebody is right there in the sales gallery handing you that cocktail in real time. So you're engaging all of those senses. And what we've seen through selling through meta reality is that it's a 90 plus percent conversion rate to purchase because people are able to truly imagine themselves in the space. So this is where you, know, you have AR, VR and the real world merging into one. And that's why I am a true believer. That's fascinating. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you can actually use crypto to purchase uh, real estate in the metaverse, which I'm assuming you can. I haven't bought anything on the metaverse just yet. I'm still, I'm still curious. And I'm, you know, it's, it's uh, something that I think we will see if it's, uh, if there's a huge buzz or whether, like you say, it's, it's here to stay, it's going to grow. Um, especially since a lot of people are working, still working from home today um, and uh, spend more time at home. So they, uh, they're definitely curious to kind of try other forms of technology because they just have a lot of spare time. Um, all right. So talking about crypto, let's uh, switch gears a bit and talk about the process aspect of real estate. And, um, you know, we, you've talked a lot on social media um, and on news about crypto. How, how do you think crypto is going to play a role in the future of real estate, especially when it comes to buying single family homes for investments? So the most, I want to say important, there are many interesting and important things, but crypto's basis is really the blockchain and it's a method of security and it's a method of streamlining a process in very, very basic terms. And right now the process of purchasing homes is a little wonky. It's a little bit old fashioned. We're doing a lot of searches, too many players involved, and it is truly ripe for that streamlining. Uh, so that's why I'm super excited about NFTs, the blockchain and crypto and how it all can work together, you know, to make a closing immediate. And we've had a couple of these now globally um, through a couple, a uh, company called Proppy. 
And they did the first complete NFT based blockchain closing. And what they did in kind of to merge the two worlds, you know, the past and the present and the future, three worlds, um, is register that closing and uh, title and everything else the old fashioned way, as well as do it on the blockchain and have an immediate uh, closing. And the importance there is it's a controlled experiment, right? You get to see the, the positives and drawbacks of each methodology. So they've been really driving uh, this innovation forward. And uh, I think that it's going to, to take off quite quickly now, you know, it's, it's really an acceleration. And uh, the way these things technically or typically go is it's, it's almost a, a straight um, shot up once somebody's figured out the system, right? Because everybody realizes how much more simple it is. Uh, and using NFTs for things like titles and um, surveys and all of these things that we used to have to go to, you know, the county offices for and look for in person. And maybe it's on like microfiche and it's just so dated and so old. But now once you can see everybody, every contractor that has visited a property, every, um, you know, piece of a, a construction process, it's it's logged in one single safe source. It's it's going to be game changing. So I think that, you know, that's the NFT and the blockchain side. And then in terms of the crypto side where it comes in is particularly with international clients. So you know, moving money between certain countries can be quite challenging. So we have a lot of international investors, especially in Mexico or in uh, excuse me, Miami and in New York City. And sometimes, you know, these closings become quite challenging because everything's fine, everything's fine. And then you get to the day of and, you know, the wires are super delayed. So um, having those be able to be done in crypto uh, makes it actually immediate through the click of a button and there's no conversion needed. It's just, um, you know, basically apples to apples instead of apples to grapes. Yeah, especially since there's, so many new millionaires and, and wealthier young people that just played a little bit with crypto and all of a sudden they have half a million dollars or a million dollars because they made uh, the right, you know, move and put some money, um, you know, invested it a year ago, six months ago, two years ago. Um, and it, it's interesting. I've, uh, I've looked online, I'm looking for a new car and I saw that most luxury brands are actually accepting crypto. And I thought, you know, that's, that's brilliant because, you know, the 25 year old guy that invested had maybe $50,000 and invested it or $20,000 and invested in crypto. And all of a sudden, you know, they have a significant amount of money. Many young people, you know, people, the first things they buy when they get, when they have money, cars and homes. And yeah, I, I was the same. So it's not, you know, I, I, um, it's not, it's not a criticism or just saying that it's, it's very smart to do it because this is, you know, your clientele, you know, the type of people who own crypto many times are young people who, you know, are eager to, to get, um, you know, luxury items. So that was, that was really interesting. Um, so when it comes to crypto, you know, um, what I do hear from many investors is that there is that risk because it's not real money in the bank. So if you um, lose your password, to a login, the money is still there. You can always, you know, reset the password. But if you lose your your token, um, uh, the key, then the money could be gone. What are your thoughts about that? Um, that fear, that challenge when it comes to accessing your your money in crypto? Yeah, I mean, there's been some horror stories, right? Where yeah. Somebody bought Bitcoin 10 years ago and, you know, they put $20 in, didn't really think about it twice. And now they're like, oh my goodness, where did I put that password? I am worth an extra $10 million and it's, uh, it can be quite frightening. So I think that, you know, the best way to mitigate it at this point is to put that password, you know, do it the old fashioned way, write it down somewhere. Maybe you have it in your phone, but you're going to have to, the whole purpose, I should circle back, the whole purpose of crypto, it's it's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? The, the value of it is because our peers see the same value. Um, it's not the gold standard. It's not a physical anything, but it, it does store value. So 
Um, as a peer-to-peer -peer network, there's a lot of independence and, and individual responsibility. And that is basically um, why the blockchain was created. So you've got to take that responsibility into your own hands. Yeah, I, I agree. There are many ways to do it. You can uh, put it in a safe. You can give it to someone you trust if you trust them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I did hear some horror stories that I don't remember who that was. Someone who um, I think died with, but it was years ago, died with a bunch of um, uh, passwords and then uh, the, their, his investors couldn't you know, access the money. So the question is, where, where is the money? Where is it? It can't just vanish, right? It's it's somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's extremely. I think it's uh, it's it's fascinating, and we're we're experiencing the world change, and this is a huge, you know, um, moment of change, and it looks like it's been going on for a few years now, but it's kind of a blip, and and things are changing. Things are going to be different in the future. Um, and speaking of um, of changes. Uh, I don't think we can, uh, uh, you know, have a, a, a true conversation um, with someone like yourself without really talking about the, what's going on in Ukraine and, and Russia. Um, and this is a good segue to our last part of the conversation, the strategy uh, part. So we all we've all heard about what's going on in Ukraine. And there's some um, speculations on how that's going to impact the U.S. economy, the world economy, um, in many levels. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts about um, how will the war in Ukraine going to impact the U.S. economy in general and the real estate here specifically? Yeah, well, we have seen actually tremendous momentum as a result of pending sanctions um, on Russia. And two particular areas where we're seeing that is uh, in Sunny Isles Beach uh, outside of Miami and in Central Park South, Billionaires Row area of New York City. Both of these two areas have an extremely high population um, of Russians um, or native Russian speakers. They might be American citizens now, they might be um, you know, still citizens of Russia, but the number of listings that have come on in the last seven days since Putin invaded Ukraine are astronomical compared to weeks prior or year over year. So we saw 16 listings either come on or be updated in the plaza residences alone, which of course is right there on Central Park South and Fifth Avenue. Um, we have over 9% of Sunny Isles Beach. If you take all price points in all buildings, over 9% of um, all of the units are on the market. It's mostly condos there, but it's, you know, this is in a very, very tight supply market, right? So all of a sudden we seem flooded with inventory in those particular locations along with a handful of others. So it's a great buying opportunity for, for those people who are looking um, in those predominantly Russian held areas. Now, that said, we don't know if it's going to get worse. We don't know if we're going to get more inventory on. It's it's a big question mark right now. So um, what we do know is that you can get something at a discount right now um, in small little sectors of the market. So uh, for those people who don't want to wait, it, it could be a chance to, to get in in a really tight market and have an opportunity to not feel like you're overpaying or like you're getting a deal, which is is hard these days. Yeah, it's interesting because there's um, historically, there's been a lot of money coming in from, uh, especially in the past, I would say five years from Russia and from other you know countries, not necessarily um, Russia, uh, money that was uh, flooding into the US, also Canada that is pretty close to us because they don't have um, you know a lot of, uh, a lot of multifamily, for instance, uh, and, and they have, you know, their real estate is, is not as as lucrative as it is here, and so a lot of money is coming from uh, around. It has been coming from around the world, invested in um, in U.S. markets. So the the opportunity that you were talking about is is very interesting because you don't have any opportunity today anywhere else to really buy um, at at a discount. There's no there are no discounts. If anything, you're lucky if you're getting. The asset at the asking price, right? There's always there's a bid and war without 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of given that many times, unfortunately, you have to overbid or you have to be very competitive, maybe on the terms, if not on the price to get um, the asset. And do you think that investors should change their investment strategy today because of what's happening in Ukraine? It really depends on their um, their basic strategy. You know, the the are they short term? Are they long term? I personally, pretty much everything I do is a long term investment, so I'm not making any changes at all. When opportunities, buying opportunities come in, come up in either the stock market or in real estate, I'm going to look to make more purchases because I bl- believe in the long term health of the United States. Um, but for those people who are operating on a more short term basis, they they might um, want to make some some moves and. Uh, decide how to mitigate a lot of the potential risk that's going to be around over the next couple of years. Got it. All right. Well, Erin, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, we actually um, now arrive to the last part of our interview, which is the lightning round questions. Five quick questions I ask all my guests. So are you ready? Yes. Okay. First one is what's your favorite hobby? Yoga. I go almost every day. Nice. Very nice. I used to do that um, also, but uh, less these days. Need to get back to it. Yoga and Pilates. Um, Second question is, what's the one thing that people don't know about you? Oh, gosh. Um, Hmm. I should know this off the top of my head, but I think the fact that I, I don't means that there's got to be something out there that's floating around that, that, that I should share more of. But um, I'm going to say that I, I'm, a, I'm a dog lover, but that's not really, that's not real. That's public information. I don't know. I don't have one. <laughs> that's fine. Hey, and some people, especially on social, very active on social media are kind of an open book. It's, it's all out there. So I totally get it. Um, the next question is what book are you currently reading or read, you know, recently, um, that impacted you and, um, you would like to share with us? There's two. Um, one is the daily stoic and the other is the four agreements and both I continuously reread and every single time I find something new. And I think they're, they're both very important in terms of how I, I manage stress, I manage conflict and mm-hmm. continue to have a, um, a positive outlook and kind of believe that, you know, everything's happening for a reason and the way that we react shows our true colors. So, you know, mm-hmm. kind of practicing that same yogic mentality of, of non-reaction when at all possible. And then you have mental clarity to make good decisions. All right. Sounds like uh, books that I need to read. Um, Next one is, um, what's your advice for uh, living an extraordinary life? Well, I I think continuous learning. Um, Mm -hmm. You you know, there's always going to be somebody smarter, somebody more successful, um, somebody that you uh, look up to. And, you know, they say the five people that you hang out with most are, you know, those are the aspects of your personality that you're nurturing. So make sure you're hanging out the right people and spending your time doing the right things and continuously growing. All right. Awesome advice. Erin, lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you and talk about real estate or anything else? Uh, Sykes Style, S-Y-K-E-S-S-T-Y-L-E uh, on Twitter or Instagram or, um, you know, just type my name in Facebook or my number, my phone number is out there in, in the <laughs> in the internet. So just call me. <laughs> All right, Erin, thank you so much again for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation and I, I know that our listeners did as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, guys, that's it for today. If you'd like to speak with us about investing in multifamily, be sure to complete our new investor form on our website. Be bold, be great, and create your own kind of extraordinary life. And I'll see you on the next episode. This show is sponsored by my company, Blue Lake Capital, where we help passive investors grow their wealth through large multifamily investments and funds. To learn more about my company and invest in with me, visit www.bluelake-capital.com.